So again, want to say hello to everyone and welcome. We're so glad that you can join us for today's State Policy Showcase. We are very excited and extremely grateful to welcome Catherine Lang, who is the Policy Specialist at Massachusetts Rivers Alliance, and Paul Galay, who is the President of Riverkeeper. And they're going to tell us about sewage right to know state policies in their respective states of Massachusetts and New York today. And just to sort of give everyone just a, a quick overview of what we're going to be talking about today, I think as we all know in our watersheds, both urban and rural, that people fish and swim and boat and play in their local waterways. And unfortunately, in many of these same waterways and far too frequently, there are sewage spills from wastewater treatment plants and sewage lines that break or leak. And we all also know that exposure to this untreated or partially treated sewage poses some really serious health risks. So it's imperative that people are sufficiently notified when sewage spills um, into their local waterways and it threatens their health and safety. Right now, there are currently no comprehensive federal requirements to notify people when there are sewage spills or leaks in their local waterways. But some states have taken action and adopted laws and regulations that require wastewater utilities to notify the public when sewage spills into their local waterways. And these laws help ensure people can protect themselves and their families and their friends by notifying them when sewage spills do occur. So on today's call, we're gonna hear from Catherine and Paul, and they're gonna tell us about sewage right to know state policies in their states of Massachusetts and New York. And they're gonna tell us about the nuts and bolts of their policy and what drove action by decision makers in their states. And then we're gonna give you all an opportunity to ask both of them questions. And then we'll open it up for all of you to discuss and share your thoughts on advancing sewage right to know policies in your states. So um, again, welcome to all of you. And to get us kicked off, we are going to, um, we wanna just ask you all some questions to just kind of hear from all of you before we hear from Catherine and Paul. I'm gonna drop a link in the chat. And if everybody could click on that link, we wanna ask you a few questions. And the first question that we wanna ask all of you is um, why are you interested in sewage right to know state policies? So when you click on that link, it should open up a window that allows you to enter your thoughts. You're welcome to share as much as you want, as many times as you like. And I'm gonna share my screen and we can see what um, everybody else um, is thinking about when what their interest is as well. So let me open up my share my screen and we can see what people's interests are. So as you're entering your thoughts in, those are showing up here on the screen share as well. That's great, we've got somebody who's on the call that's on a wastewater board. Um, we have someone who's interested if their state has these types of policies because they, because their dogs love to swim. My dog loves to swim too. We wanna to make sure that our waters are safe for swimming. That interest in common sense legislation, yeah. Um, interested in data on if, if data is collected on sewage and reported on, good, good. Um, safety and protection for recreation, great. Oh, and then wanting to see if those notifications can lead to more effective regulatory controls, excellent wanting to know how other states have implemented these policies to see how it might apply in their state, which is Texas in this case. Um, thank you, Darlene. She, Darlene put in the chat um, that she's leading on this issue for Washington State Sierra Club. Great, thank you and welcome Darlene and everyone else. Great, lots of different interests. So this is great. So I'm gonna now advance to our next slide. And we're gonna ask you one more question before we turn it over to Paul and Catherine. So give me just a second here to bring up my the next slide. Thank you for being patient with me here. 
All right, so that should now open up in Mentimeter for you. Another question, what do you hope to learn during today's showcase? So just take a minute to share what you're hoping to learn today. Look forward to hearing from all of you. Great, so some templates on policies or ordinances, wanting to get some of the best uh, examples that are out there, that's great. Wanting to know what, the, what kind of coalitions, who all sort of came to the table and helped advocate for these policies, how, the, how these states have handled their regulatory policies. Great. Lots of good feedback here. Understanding how the policies are developed and how they're implemented. Excellent. And just wanting to hear these great examples. Okay. Best practices for updating or putting into place sewage right to know laws. This is great. All right, wonderful, everyone. I'm gonna stop my screen share now. And I am now going to turn it over to Catherine. She's going to kick us off and she's going to tell us about the sewage right to know policy in Massachusetts. And then after we hear from Catherine, we're going to hear from Paul. He's going to tell us about New York. And um, as you listen to Catherine and Paul's presentations, please feel free to ask questions, make comments, or add your own reflections in the chat. And then um, following Paul's presentation, we're going to have a Q&A, an open Q&A session, so we can take your questions from the chat, and then you'll also be welcome to just ask them verbally if you want to come off mute. So, Catherine, I'll now go ahead and turn it over to you. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, April. All right. Are we live on screen with this? Yeah, perfect. Okay, great. Um, so thank you for that kind introduction. Like she said, I'm Catherine Lang. I'm the policy specialist for the Massachusetts Rivers Alliance. We are a statewide nonprofit organization in, in the Commonwealth. We have 80 member organizations, many of whom are watershed associations, but also we encompass land trusts, um, environmental justice organizations, other conservation groups. Um, so we are really pleased to work with a coalition of folks across the state. This picture uh, is of downtown Boston. So if you've ever been to Massachusetts, you might have been here on the Esplanade downtown. This is the Charles River, very popular for recreation. Um, I live very close to the Charles. This is a river that experiences a pretty large amount of sewage pollution in our state, despite being so scenic and so central to our largest city. So um, if you've been here, this has been a, an issue all along. Um, and I'll note that I have been with Mass Rivers since last summer. So while I was involved for the final leg of this bill's journey, most of the work and the foundation building was done by my predecessor, Gabby Queenan, and all of our organizational partners that I'll mention. So I know all of you know the, the issues with sewage pollution and all of the threats that they pose in Massachusetts. Here we have about 3 billion gallons of sewage that enters our waterways every year. That comes from 19 different permittees across almost 200 outfalls. Um, the biggest river that experiences, or I should say the river with the most pollution is the Merrimack. That's on the North shore of Massachusetts. It goes into New Hampshire as well, up by Concord. Um, they have five wastewater treatment plants up there, but across the state, if you think about Massachusetts, we are pretty old. We have old cities that have old sewer systems. So this unfortunately is kind of a widespread issue for us here. You can see my little DIY Google map of where outfalls are located in our state. And on the left is the name of a city and how many outfalls they have. So while you might think of Boston and Cambridge as kind of the epicenter of this, and we certainly have our fill, um, the Connecticut River by Springfield and Chicopee also has a really large amount of outfalls and, and pollution. So this is where um, we were focusing our efforts and where some of our member groups who represent these areas really came in and gave us their local perspective of what was happening in their watersheds. So speaking of partners, we were so lucky to work with an amazing group of, of folks. This picture are 
the legislative sponsors. So in the middle, you have Representative Linda Dean Campbell. She represents a district on the Merrimack, that river on the North Shore that has the largest amount of sewage pollution in New England. Um, and then on the left is Senator Pat Jalen. She's from Somerville, which is Metro Boston area, um, as is Representative Provost on the right. She's now retired. This was her kind of last big bill that she passed before she stepped away from her post. But these three were the sponsors of the bill, um, and they were tenacious in their advocacy throughout the committee process and getting the bill um, to come up for a vote. So we're really grateful for their leadership because they all have sewage pollution in their districts. They knew firsthand why this was an issue and why it was so crucial that we get a bill passed on this. Um, the impetus for the bill actually was a young man, I think a high school student, maybe a college student, this is before my time, um, but a, a guy who lived on the Mystic River in Senator Jalen's district in the Blue Coat, and he approached her and said that he saw fecal contamination in the river, and what was she going to do about it? And that was the impetus for her to say, well, gee, what am I going to do about it? And here we are all these years later. Um, we also had a number of organizational partners, as I mentioned, all of these watershed associations um, played a huge role in providing local data, getting local partners, and talking to their own legislators about why this issue was so pertinent and um, important for us to pass. Um, in Massachusetts, our legislative cycle is two years, so each session is two years. This bill was introduced eight years ago, so four sessions. Mass Rivers has been involved for the past three sessions. Like I said, I'm relatively new with almost a year under my belt, um, but it took a long time for this bill to finally get passed. So it was a journey of many years and a lot of coalition building in that time. Um, in the last one and a half years before the bill was passed, um, Mass Rivers Policy Director Gabby had a number of meetings with water suppliers. And I'm sure those of you who are working on your own right to know bills are probably doing the same thing. But um, during our advocacy, we found that water suppliers had a lot of concerns about this bill. Oftentimes they were opposed to the bill. And so it was important that our community met with them and found out what exactly those concerns were, if it was possible for us to maybe address them, if there was anything in the bill that we could change to make them more comfortable with the language and to maybe get them um, a little bit more supportive of the bill. So we had a number of those meetings with water suppliers um, from different cities in, in the state. One, piece that we ended up um, changing a bit in response to their concerns was on metering versus modeling. Originally, the bill was written so that as a discharge was happening, um, the exact volume would be metered and reported out as part of the notification. In response to their concerns of that metering being too burdensome or expensive, um, now the bill is written that they can use historic data on discharge amounts. Um, with the last three years of data to say what the average volume is based on how much precip is coming down. So um, that was one point that we, we did change in response to their concerns. And this picture is from um, the hearing in front of the Environment Committee at the State House. So after all of those years of advocacy, uh, we did get the bill signed earlier this year. This is Governor Charlie Baker. Um, they signed it into law in January, but then they actually had a little ceremonial bill signing virtual, of course, in February um, because the governor knew from hearing from these legislators how important this issue was and how many folks had been involved over the years. So it was really nice to have that recognition and that, that moan of celebration together in February. All right, so what's in the bill? Here's the good stuff. Um, and again, this was all negotiated over years of talking to partners and water suppliers. Um, first off, the notification has to be issues, issued within two hours of discovery of the discharge and continue every eight hours until the discharge is done. In that notification, you have to include the location of the outfall, the time, date, and duration of the discharge, um, how much is coming out of that outfall. Again, that's based on historical data rather than live metering. Um, you have to know which areas are affected, both land and water, who the permittee is, um, and how folks can avoid contact with the hazardous waste coming out. 
That notification goes to our State Department of Public Health, our State Department of Environmental Protection, the Municipal Board of Health that has the outfall, um, and also any municipality directly impacted. So in our mind, that's folks who are downstream who are also receiving the sewage and the waters. Um, the notification also goes to the two largest news organizations that cover that area with the outfall, whether that's a print newspaper, an online forum, whatever those org organizations are. Um, and then, of course, the public notification system that folks can opt into to receive um, advisories to their phone or to their email. That goes out as well. And then the, we, there is language that um, the Department of Environmental Protection can require voicemails or social media as needed or as they see fit. Um, so like I mentioned, the permittee has to create that website where folks can go in and opt in to receive those notifications. Um, they also must submit to DEP an annual report of all of their discharge activity, and that will also be posted to that same website. So while you're there opting in, you can see kind of what to expect and what kind of outfall activity is in your neighborhood. Um, finally, we have a signage requirement in the language as well. Um, I put a direct quote on top that DEP may require conspicuous warning signage at outfalls and public access points. Um, each sign has to include that there is an outfall there, when a discharge might occur, so wet weather events, um, explain the public health threats that exist, and then also provide the website for how folks can opt into that notification system. Um, and again, this is at all public access points. So this could be state owned land, this might be private land, this might be um, town owned land. So the permittee and DEP will have to work with those different landowners to set up the signs. Of course, immediately, our hope for this law is that folks can avoid coming in contact with sewage. That's obviously the goal. Um, and as you saw on the map, most of our outfalls are in really urban locations in our state um, where we have state designated environmental justice communities. Long term, of course, notification is only the first step. We hope that one day we won't have sewage pollution at all. Um, so with increased public awareness and folks understanding that this happens in their neighborhood and why it's bad for their communities, um, there will be more public support for eventually upgrading sewer systems, separating them and avoiding this in the first place. Um, and then if and when that happens, that's great for our waterways and great for our communities. So as I mentioned, this bill was signed early in 2021 in January. Now we're in the regulatory process. So that goes to our State Department of Environmental Protection. Um, in the spring, in February and March, I think they held three stakeholder meetings, one with water suppliers, one with environmental advocacy groups like Mass Rivers, and then a third meeting with everyone together to go over what our top concerns were, what our priorities were, and what we were really looking for um, in the regs once they were rolled out. So DEP has until next summer to promulgate these regs. We are watching really closely uh, this process and making sure that they stick to their timeline and to make sure that they address some of our concerns. Um, of course, in our state, we have a lot of combined sewer overflows, but this bill was really written to include both CSOs and SSOs, which we certainly have as well. Um, in the first few stakeholder meetings, there was a lot of pushback to DEP about the inclusion of SSOs that doing the same kind of notification, the same signage would be really difficult for those events. So that's something that we're watching to see how DEP handles inclusion of SSOs and to what extent it's really important to us that they do. And so we'll see what they come up with. Um, again, the signage piece was pretty broad, making sure that there's a sign at every public access point to a water that might be um, contaminated. So. That's important to us to make sure that downstream folks are still being notified and still understand what potential hazards might be there. Um, and then finally, as I mentioned, thinking about our urban populations and our environmental justice communities, making sure that the signs are in all the appropriate languages and even aside from the languages, making sure that the actual text is really easy to understand and that we avoid technical jargon um, 
for folks who might not be familiar with what a CSO even is. Um, so that's something that we're tracking very closely and we will let you all know how that goes and when, when the regs come out. We do have a, a web page on our website with this whole journey of the bill and detailing some of, uh, some of the work that went into it by our partners. Um, that's my email. I'm happy to talk about this anytime. <laughs> uh, you can always reach out and, and contact me. But I guess the moral of the story for us is, although getting the bill signed was a huge moment of celebration for our community and there was so much work legislatively to make that happen, um, that was really only the first hurdle. Now, when we are going through the regulatory process, there's still so much that we have to fight for to make sure that it's included in the rollout and that even though the legislators voted to pass this, this bill and the governor chose to sign it, those are not the same people who are now making the regs. And so we have to continue our advocacy to educate this group of people, this agency, and make sure that they understand all of our concerns and that we demonstrate the need for um, inclusion of SSOs, for example, ample signage, environmental justice concerns in the regs. So it really is a, a long process that although the bill signing felt like the end of the road, it certainly was not in our case. And so the, the journey continues in Massachusetts. Thank you so much, Catherine. Really, really appreciate all of your hard work on behalf of this issue and sharing it with us today. And I'm gonna turn it over to Paul Galay now who's uh, president at Riverkeeper to tell us about New York's sewage right to know law. And I think this will be an interesting contrast where Massachusetts law is relatively new and still um, the, the all the details are being worked out. New York's law has been in place for a while now and we can hear from Paul about how um, that what the what he has learned and what his organization has learned um, over the years that their law has been in place. So Paul, I'll now turn it over to you and thank you so much for being here and sharing with us today. Okay, can everyone hear me okay? A thumbs up or two if you can. Yay, Great. okay, excellent. And congratulations to Catherine and thanks of course to April and Catherine B for inviting me. Uh, we are looking at uh, a sewage pollution right to know law in New York that's about eight years old. And the advantage uh, of having this uh, be an eight year old law is that we have some track record and we can talk with you about some of the benefits, both direct and indirect. Um, uh, first of all, a word about myself. Um, I've been at Hudson River Keeper for 11 years. Prior to that, I spent a decade in the land conservation movement and also 13 years in New York state government. So I worked in the New York City office of the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation as a regulator of the New York City Department of Environmental Protection, which operates uh, 14 sewage treatment plants processing over a billion gallons a day, and that's on a dry weather day. So I've had some experience as a regulator as well as in the nonprofit world. And to turn to the right to know law, uh, it is very similar in many regards to Catherine's bill in Massachusetts. And uh, it of course gives the public the right to know, there'll be a lot more details about that. And in the screens that will be shared with you by April and Catherine L. Abi after the presentation, there's a list of references so you can dig into the regs and dig into the language of the law and see some of the reporting that's been done. Uh, what we found and what's most interesting about how things have processed through the period after passage of this law is what it's triggered by way of regulation, which is a point that someone made in the initial portion when um, April asked those good questions. And uh, it's also driven a tremendous investment in wastewater treatment plant improvement and in local activism and advocacy. So, um, we, we, we all have our photos with our elected officials. Uh, ours has a golden plunger. Uh, my colleague, Tracy Brown, now at Save the Sound in Connecticut, 
was given uh, by the main bill sponsor in the New York State Senate, the Golden Plunger Award for our bill. Um, and we got a big kick out of that. Uh, it was a bill that had bipartisan support. At the time, the New York State Senate was controlled by the Republican Party, and the New York State Assembly was called, controlled by the uh, Democratic Party. It was really uh, one of those nice rare moments where we had two parties coming together to do something that folks really needed. And I think that if there's one reason why, it was the consciousness that had been raised through a combination of efforts by Riverkeeper uh, and the New York State Comptroller to share the data that we had compiled, so showing an extraordinarily high level of bacteriological contamination, especially in the tributaries to the Hudson. The New York State Comptroller released a report indicating how much deferred capital investment there was waiting to be made in New York State's wastewater treatment plants, 60% of which were at least three decades beyond the time that they should have been refurbished or replaced. And you might find that number extraordinary. It, it still is extraordinary to me, even if I've known it for, for years and years. But you know, this is why our infrastructure gets a D plus uh, by the engineering societies, if we're lucky. So there was a tremendous consciousness of the need for the public to know about contamination if we weren't going to keep it from happening in the first place. So what does the sewage pollution right to know law require? Again, much as Catherine L has presented, it requires uh, notification, notification of the public of any unpermitted discharge that violates standards within two hours. There's a formal reporting uh, system, uh, much like when you get an alert on your phone, you can get an alert of one of these discharges. And of course, again, location, amount, likely duration of discharge. The sewage pollution right to know law has led to a tremendous consciousness of the remaining uh, pollution issues that we have not resolved. I guess this law was passed, call it 42 years after the Clean Water Act was put into place which therefore makes it about 27 years after we were supposed to have eliminated contamination issues in our waterways. And as a consequence of people saying, well, we haven't done that yet, have we? For the first time in uh, decades in New York, starting in 2015, there were state grants to local municipalities as opposed to revolving loans. Uh, there was uh, initially, a sewage pollution um, water infrastructure improvement act in 2015. It was a modest $400,000 in state grants. 2017, there was a larger water infrastructure investment act, which I believe was $2 billion. And since then there have been another um, three uh, tranches at $500 million each. Just in our Hudson River watershed alone, which is call it, you know, 20% of the state watershed, there has been over a billion dollars spent between the state grants, the local matches, uh, just in our watershed since these dollars became available. And again, New York State, when they report, and I'll put this in a later screen, they've increased permit violation enforcement because this is just almost like another form of discharge monitoring report. Um, so there is data, and there's this awful picture of a CSO in New York City, more about New York City in a moment, uh, not too hard to spot the CSO. Um, New York State tracks the data. As you can see, just in one, one year period, there were 4,200 discharges violative of state standards, and it includes CSOs from 246 facilities, 4,000 discharges, had the potential to reach a water body, estimated total volume of discharges, 4 billion gallons. That's what drives investment. That's what's driven the creation of local watershed improvement uh, volunteer groups, like in our watershed, the Rondout Creek Watershed Alliance, the Wallkill River Watershed Alliance. Uh, they started out as volunteers. They were under Hudson River Keepers 501c3 Incorporation as a sort of a strategic project. Then they got their own 501c3 incorporation. 
uh, they still are modestly staffed, but you know, local activism makes a difference. It makes sure that the municipalities are applying for the grants. Uh, before we get to ongoing challenges, I wanna talk with, about a corollary to the Water Infrastructure Investment Act $3.9 billion that I mentioned. Uh, it's up to $3.9 billion now that we have our state budget in New York as of, um, as of April 1, another $500 million. And they've started to spend it again. They stopped spending it during the pandemic, but then there was the uh, bill that helped municipalities and states get their finances back in order. And so New York has done another request for proposals for new grants. Um, another law was passed side by side, not with the sewage pollution right to know law, which was from 2012, but with the Water Infrastructure Investment Act of 2017. And that was um, the Emerging Contaminants Protection Act, which required, explicitly required regulatory standards for PFAS chemicals and 1,4-dioxane, but even more importantly, required all municipal systems down to 25 uh, suppliers for, for drinking water to test drinking water for a larger suite of emerging contaminants, which the state health department regs have uh, now sort of scoped out. And I think this is opening the next large can of worms. Now that we're starting to dig into our backlog of in deferred investment in our wastewater treatment facilities, what about the water supply systems that are not properly screening for PFAS chemicals and for other emerging contaminants? That was the law, frankly, that the municipal operators were most concerned about. And New York does now have some very good tough standards on um, several of the PFAS chemicals and on 1,4-dioxane. But this is still larger than the uh, wastewater treatment plants have the capacity to deal with in terms of fully implementing this second, or I guess third law, along with the Sewage Pollution Right to Know law, the Water Infrastructure Investment Act, and that is our Emerging Contaminants Protection Act. So ongoing challenges. Um, of course, I really should um, move my um, uh, thumbnail photos of you all so that I can see the text. Uh, again, 4 billion gallons in one most recent measured year. That's still a lot of pollution when we're supposed to have undone all of this pollution. The good news, at least for CSOs in New York City, is that it was 80 billion gallons a year in the 1980s. Now it's down to roughly 20 billion gallons a year. So that's a lot of progress. And this, the amount of pollution in those um, CSO events, you know, you see the one here in the middle, they're not all that bad. They're of far lesser strength in terms of the signal of uh, sanitary sewage to stormwater than they were back in the 80s. So there's been a lot of progress made, but that's not the measure for the Clean Water Act. The measure for the Clean Water Act is, is elimination of these uh, discharges. That's why they call them the National Pollutant Elimination Discharge Permit System. Uh, I think I'm going to skip because uh, alas, I need to leave at 2.45 and I wanna leave time for questions I do have to take a family member to the airport. And um, ironically, we have a storm in New York. And so um, uh, the notifications will begin shortly. But uh, long story short, our biggest challenge is that the New York City Department of Environmental Conservation, by far our largest discharge system, has decided that even though CSOs occurred on the East River on 82 days in 2018, they were going to issue zero notices for the East River that year because they did a blending of the results that they were finding and saying that the CSO uh, became so dilute that it didn't really trigger violations of governing uh, ambient standards along the lines that they used to say when I was at the New York State DEC of the solution to pollution is dilution and the city of New York is treating the way to get out of discharge notification is also dilution. So we have sued on that and quite frustratingly, we lost in the lower court, but we are appealing uh, that ruling. 
And if we lose that ruling, then we're going to go to the legislature and make sure that this loophole that the city has created and the state has allowed is eliminated. So still, still a lot of bugs in the system, no pun intended. So looking ahead, uh, we've got a tremendous amount of investment. A billion dollars alone in our 12,000 square mile watershed is starting to make a difference. You know, Riverkeeper does its own sampling work. The samples are starting to show the results of that investment. Uh, there has been an increase in enforcement by New York State. When we get to the very last screen, you'll see uh, links to the state's resource page and you'll see them refer to uh, how they're trying to do better on enforcement. And then finally, we're starting to capture more data on CSO discharges as more and more systems start in installing the sensors that um, Catherine referred to are not mandated, uh, I believe not mandated in the Massachusetts law and also not mandated in the New York state law. So um, I will end simply by uh, showing this screen where you can find the link to the law. The law is miraculously less than a page and a half long. Uh, more resources uh, from New York state, including their guidance to the municipal wastewater treatment systems. Uh, recent alerts on their notification plan, uh, page and and here's one of them. So this is the system we have. It's great that it's triggering more information. It will lead to and has leaded, led to safer swimming. But just as importantly, cleaner water is driven by investment. Investment has been driven by this notification and transparency. It's also driven by activism and activism too has been driven by this discharge. So I'm gonna stop my share hang in there for hopefully a couple of questions and then uh, go sit in traffic on the way to JFK and think of you all fondly. Perfect. Thanks so much to both of you and um, for staying with us. And we got a lot of great questions in the chat. So yeah, let's get started with them. So we do catch you for a little bit all. So um, I'm gonna skip around a little bit. So my first question for both of you is, is how you worked with the um, utility community, um, wastewater and, and maybe water suppliers um, how did you build those coalitions and work with those organizations, individually or as coalitions? You should go first, Paul. So uh, fortunately, we had a lot of folks in the Department of Environmental Conservation, some of whom were my colleagues when I worked there in the 90s, who wanted to see this law passed. And they made the tie between us and uh, large dischargers like the New York City DEP and the uh, dischargers around Albany, they call themselves the Albany Pool and the New York Water Environment Association. We all sat in the same room and hashed out, you know, their first insistence that we cut out CSOs and our refusal to do so and their uh, desire to um, avoid, um, having to discharge to um, to uh, monitor in um, uh, with the sensors and that we had to give on because we couldn't have gotten enough of the systems to do so we we hashed it out we figured it out together in the same room in a series of discussions uh, with a lot of aid from the governor's office from the New York State governor so uh, it was quite collaborative surprisingly collaborative uh, and again somewhat bipartisan Okay. Hi, this is, oh, no, please go for it. Okay. I was to say, this is Charlotte. I'm with uh, Michigan Environmental Council. Um, we have a very outdated right to know law. Um, I, last time I recall looking at it, I think it still required like newspaper notification or something along those lines. So I'm wondering sort of what what you what process you guys went through to figure out what's the best way to get information to people. Like what are those requirements um, that you wanted to include in your um, in your laws or in your policy uh, so that you know that you're sort of pushing forward the most effective communications measures you can. I think for us, the signage piece is really big. Um, making sure that 
as our language has that all public access points have language about this and then making sure that that language is really plain for people that they get the moral of the story that after it rains this water is unsafe and here's why um, again we are in the regulatory process now so i don't know how successful we'll be but um, the opt-in notification system is huge um, one of our water suppliers already operates a, a, a system before this bill even happened. So that was a really great model to show the other suppliers, like, you can do this. They're already doing it. It works well. Um, I subscribe to it and it is eye-opening. Um, but I think the, the signage piece, it was really important to us too, especially thinking about the populations that we're serving, folks who are like sustenance fishing in our cities, they really need to know at the point of contact. Oh, do you have anything to add on, on that question? No, just that I put the Nile Alert system link into the chat, and uh, that has actually proved to be very effective. Uh, and we are absolutely supportive of more signage, and that's probably a good thing for us to work on if we get to bill amendments. And I'll add, Charlotte, if you're looking at just strengthening your law, um, Connecticut actually yesterday did that. They had a right to know law and they've just strengthened it. And I haven't gone through it yet, so I don't know exactly what the parameters are, but um, they just beefed it up. So might be something to look at to see what their process was. Great. Yeah, thank you. As I only have two minutes made, I please take a shot at Max Gomberg's question. Yeah, I was going to go to that one next. That'd be great. Cool, cool. And for those of you who aren't looking at the screen, were the grant dollars made available from 2015 onwards passed with bipartisan support in the legislature? I'm happy to say that that is a huge yes. And it's even better than that because it started off in the legislature. And like so many states, there's money that's put in forward by the legislature. There's money that's put forward by the governor. This is money that was put forward by the legislature. And that usually is sort of a uh, anathema to a governor, and they say, like, well, that's legislature money. I'm not going to go near there. Um, our governor uh, actually, two years later, took a legislative priority and made it his own and um, increased it fivefold, which shows the strength of clean water investment, which was a combination of the right to know. It was a combination of the folks being uh, informed about pollution by groups like Riverkeeper that did testing. So again, it was a huge, huge win that was not only bipartisan, but also not, you know, governor versus legislature. And I do dearly wish that I could stay longer, but uh, it's, a, it's a rough day to travel. So um, yeah. I'm, I'm, gonna put my, I'm gonna put my email address in the chat in case okay. anybody wants to do follow up with me that way. And again, um, I hope that folks will um, have a look at the screens when April should air them. Perfect. Thanks, Everybody. Paul. Safe travels. Yep. Now. Talk to you later. Um, so, Catherine, I want to go back to you real quickly. I think you might have had an answer on building bridges with utility. Did you want to touch on that before we move on to the next one? Sure. I didn't have an answer that was as good as Paul's. Um, we that was that was kind of our our biggest. Uh, kind of obstacle throughout our legislative journey was working with, with wastewater utilities. Um, it seemed like in Paul's case, they had some stronger relationships than, than, than we did. Um, as I mentioned, our largest water supply, in Mass, we have like one really big water supplier that does Metro Boston and, and some of the Springfield area cities. Um, that's huge. And then we have tiny little water suppliers. So it's like one big one and all these smaller ones. Um, and the one big one had a notification system already in place that they were operating. And again, Metro Boston, we have a lot of outfalls over here. So the fact that they had this in place and were an example that this is doable, it's helpful. Um, the public backlash that some folks were thinking might come, um, to my knowledge, did not come when, when these folks put that system in place. Um, so that was a good model, but yeah, we uh, we've we've we had a tough time on that one. Yeah, they'll do. 
Do anyone else on the phone have experience with that on building bridges with utilities as part of this work? Feel free to come off mute if you'd like to. Okay, or add to the chat. Yeah, it seems like a really important part of the piece of this puzzle, right? And the student notification. Um, so another question for you, um, another one from Max is, will your state agency process, uh, those, the development of those regulations cover penalties? Um, that's, that's a good question. Um, I don't think it does. I don't think that our, um, yeah, I don't think our language includes anything about penalties, which is interesting. We're just assuming everyone is going to abide 100% and we're going to have total compliance. Um, I don't know. That's a good question. And I, it remains to be seen. Well, I, I wonder in particular, um, so, so you mentioned that it's, the, the, the language is permissive to DEP in terms of requiring signage, for example. So if they determine that there are signage requirements and then, uh, you know, a, a wastewater agency or a, a, a CSO or SSO, you know, violates that by not posting the signage or not doing it in time. I mean, how would you anticipate trying to build in uh, accountability there? Yeah, that's that's a really good point. Um, and I would imagine that we would, we would go for like, if, if, you're, if you're late on putting up the sign, like, okay, but please just do it. Please just, you know, accomplish the goal rather than like finding them. So I, I don't know how we're going to accomplish that. I think we are more worried now about the signage requirements that DEP wants before we can worry about the penalty part, if that makes sense. Um, because not only is the language permissive to them on the signage part, but there's a couple other places too where DEP has to create some criteria for different things. And so we are really waiting to see, well, actively waiting, we are advocating in this process, but waiting to see what their parameters are before we think about that. So you're a step ahead of us. <laughs> um, let's take uh, April, let's take one more question. And so Darlene, I may ask you to come off for this one. So Darlene had a question about, is anyone working to move municipalities to safer sewage processing methods? And, um, and I'm not sure whether you mean new methodologies or more stringent standards or perhaps both or perhaps something else. So, Yes, method, methodologies, um, you know, Europe and other uh, countries have moved to safer types of processing. We never refer to it as um, treatment because <laughs> it the waste really is not treated in these uh, processing plants very minutely. Um, so we're looking to see what other countries might be doing to more safely handle their uh, sewage processing um, cleaner and how they're, you know, uh, if they're disposing it. We're not talking, it would be nice. The What goes into the water, the effluent is a tougher one, but the solids, there's more uh, science for. Okay, thank you. Yeah, that's, that's really helpful. I don't know, are there others who, um, anyone would like to respond to that if you're working on that or have ideas or resources in that area? All right, Darlene, I don't know, but it sounds like you're gonna have to join our online community and throw it out to the larger community there because I bet someone will have something to say back to you. So we'll follow up with you, get you on there if you're not already. Um, let's see, I'm just checking to see if there's any other questions that we missed here. I think we got most of them. Um, are there any other questions if anyone would just like to either put in the chat or come off mute and final questions for Catherine or ideas about this before I hand it back to April? Yeah, hi, this is Steve Jandoli. I was just wondering if you know if New Jersey or Pennsylvania have sewage right now laws off the top of your head. I have to investigate further, but I thought maybe if you came across that now. Okay. Steve, that's a great question. And um, one of the things that 
we're hoping to do at River Network that we're just getting started on and um, is starting to build what we're calling a state policy hub. One of the things that folks like yourself have have said to River Network over the years is like, we'd really like to know what the status of these policies are in different places around the country. And um, if you were able to have like one central place where we could look at the status of these policies and see some best examples, that would be really helpful to us. So while we don't have that yet, um, it's definitely an aspiration of ours. And um, sewage right to know is one of those topics that has definitely risen to the top to, that people have said, you know, that we're, that they're really interested in. So we're, that's one that we're looking at. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Well, I, I yeah, add, one yeah. other thing about our coalition building process was that um, although we didn't have quite the relationship that Paul seems to have with utilities, we did um, at one point have a, a lot of municipal support and we sent a letter um, to lawmakers when the bill was still in, in the state house with 144 municipal officials signed on. And that was a real turning point for us, um, having their support then. And then even now during the executive process, bringing them back and saying, you supported this and we're really grateful for that. And now we get to do this, this reg process um, and having their municipal support has been enormous for us. Same. Well, yeah, it makes me think too. And one the question is, um, yeah, I see the question about wastewater board members is that when we were working on this issue at the federal level and came really close to pass notifications, one reason we got as far as we did is that we spent a lot of time cultivating public health um, associations, the national and some of the state ones who were, you know, sometimes we were working on water, sometimes we weren't, but that was really also powerful and just curious um, if that was, you know, how did you interface with those groups? if at all. Yeah, we we had a couple folks from the public health community weigh in. Um, I think the one benefit of working on this legislation is that it's pretty straightforward. You know, the, the public health experts can, can all definitely offer a lot about the impacts. Um, but one thing that we appreciated throughout this journey was that folks who, even if you haven't heard about CSOs before and SSOs, if you hear that there's sewage in the water, like, you get the gist. <laughs> so um, that was that was you know e an easier thing to message out to people than some of the other kind of more complex public health things that we work on with with water. Um, yeah, and Juliet suggests too um, that thinking in terms of coalitions about wastewater board members um, or local sort of utility board members. I think we got one one person at least joined us at the beginning. I don't know if that person's still here. Um, so. Yeah, that's a, another opportunity in terms of coalition building. So to wrap us up, we have about five minutes left and um, we wanna sort of turn the conversation um, to all of you who are joining us. I'm gonna put some um, prompts in the chat. Um, we always like to wrap these conversations up by just sort of hearing from you what you're taking away from this conversation today. So we would, Love it if you would either put in the chat or come off of mute would even be better. And just sort of tell us like some of the takeaways that you're um, coming away with from the today's state policy showcase with and how you might use some of the information um, that you gathered here today. And whether that's um, about the nuts and bolts of state uh, sewage right to know policy um, barriers and roadblocks that you're now more aware of that you would want to um, approach and strategies that you would want to, um, that you might be thinking about using, windows of opportunity that you might be looking for, um, what you might have learned about coalitions that you'd want to build or any other strategies that you'd want to use. And so um, please share those in the um, chat if you like, but if somebody would want to come off mute and just sort of tell us something that they're coming away with, um, please, uh, please, please let us know what some, some good advice that you're taking away from today's call. I'm really heartened to hear Paul's story because they are ahead of us with their law that he said that there was a lot of investment in their wastewater infrastructure after the passage of this law and it led to a lot more local awareness 
of sewage pollution. So that is excellent news for us. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Anybody else have anything else they want to share about what they're taking away from today's call? Well, Catherine, I want to say thank you to you. I am um, taking away, you know, just sort of the, I think the thing that was sort of um, present for me while I was listening to um, your presentation is that these state laws are often, are very often not quick wins. Persistence is the name of the game. You have to, it's, and to not get discouraged if at first you don't succeed, that you just sort of have to go into it knowing that it might take several years and that you start where you start and you build momentum over time and just stick with it over time. So that was, um, I really appreciate that um, piece of wisdom that I gathered from your presentation and also just for all your hard work and for being willing to share it with us today. So thank you so much for that. Anyway, Juliet, oh, go ahead, Catherine. I was gonna say if you're ever in Boston, look out for the outfalls. <laughs> yeah, for sure, for all of us. Hey, Julia, I saw that um, you just turned your video on and you put in a, a great comment there. I'd, I'd invite you to share that too. That's great. Yeah, so I'm sitting in like philanthropy seat. So I thought it would just be saying something about fixing this funder. Um, you know, the policy passage is obviously really exciting and important, but um, as you've all noted, it's the first step in the regulatory process and then enforcement and those second third, fourth pieces can be less exciting. Um, so figuring out ways to talk to funders about, um, you know, I wouldn't call it the long game, but just being able to um, think about if you, if there, if you, if you're, if you have a funder who's interested in a policy win, maybe you can package it with like two years of regulatory support and, um, and an enforcement project or something. So that, that like there, you know, that there are pieces that go together. Yeah, that's a very, an excellent insight. Thank you, Juliet. Anyone else? I, I'm just curious. Uh, oh, go ahead. Oh, go, no, go ahead. Oh, I just wanted to say, uh, I'm uh, Ajman in Houston, Texas. And of course we have some, I'm with the Sierra Club. And um, so we have a little bit different things uh, that we have to work with, but this is my first time really uh, realizing that uh, the contamination and, and our sewage system is just as important. So I think we may start looking at some options. So I really appreciate this. Great, and so glad that you could be here for the conversation today. Thanks, that's an excellent insight. If I could just respond to that, uh, maybe you would join our national, Sierra Club National Wastewater Residuals Team. Um, we've been working from Sierra Club at the national level, and I think you might have some people in Texas um, working on this. I'm not sure they're Sierra Club members though, but we'd be, um, very pleased to talk to you further. Okay, that would be great. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Good. I'm glad you all connected. Yeah. Just jumping off from that, I, I'm just curious if any of you have sort of thought or been engaged in sort of the, the national level infrastructure funding discussions ongoing and, and how to um, sort of effectively potentially build bridges to the uh, you know, wastewater agencies in terms of the need for that funding and, and showcasing how it could really um, sort of, you know, benefit everyone. Yeah, great question, Max. So I will say for, I know several of you on here, Nancy and Catherine, I know for sure, um, we do a monthly water federal water policy update call and all of you would be welcome to join that call. And that's where we're um, talking with each other about how we can show up together to advocate for those investments um, in infrastructure and wastewater infrastructure. And so if you're not on that list to get those email updates as well as invitations to attend those calls, 
Um, I will um, follow up with all of you after the call today and make sure that you can opt into that if you're not already on the list. So thanks for flagging that too, Max, because it's all of this is connected. Yep. All right. So KB put into the chat a link to an evaluation. We would love your feedback. Um, it's very short survey. Um, we take your feedback and, and take it to heart to make these offerings better. And um, with that, I know we're at time. So I just want to say another huge thank you to Catherine and Paul, even though he's not here, we'll, we'll put that out into the ether. Thank you to Paul again. But Catherine, thank you so much for all you do and to all of you for um, being here and being part of this conversation today. It was really great to be with you all. And um, we'll keep you on the list for um, other state policy updates that we'll be doing or state policy showcases that we'll do in the future. And KB, I'll turn it over to you for the last word. Uh, I got nothing to add. This is fabulous. I love this topic and it's great to see it come back around. Congratulations to all the great work and look forward to seeing y'all again on another call. Thanks. Have a great afternoon, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.